Hebrews chapter 9, verses 1 to 14. We're not going to read the entire text this morning. Uh, just I'm going to focus on a specific verse uh, 14 today. Uh, but we'll be talking through the whole text, but I'm just going to focus on reading verse 14 at this time. So if you have your Bibles with you, go ahead and open it up to Hebrews chapter 9, and I'm going to read from verse 14. How much more than will the blood of Christ who through the eternal spirit offered himself unblemished to God, cleanse our consciences from acts that lead to death, so that we may serve the living God. Let me pray for us. Dear God, we just thank you for another day you've given us to come together as a family, to, to be with each other, to be with you, um, another ch chance for us to worship you, and another chance to hear from your word. And God, um, as we're here this morning, all we're looking to do is read from your word, to learn from your word, and that, that your word would change us, transform us as we walk out these doors, that it would in some way alter uh, our view of you, our, our worship of you, our lifestyle, um, ultimately that you would free us to, to serve you as a living God. We love you, we thank you, God, for this time. We just ask you to bless the time that we have together as we study your word. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Um, as we begin this morning, before I get into the text, I want to just draw a few questions out there and, and just questions for us to think about and wrestle with as we enter into this text. The issue of regret, uh, the issue of guilt, how is it that we are to address such emotions, such feelings? Uh, whether we're a Christian or not, when we are faced with guilt or regret, how is it that would respond to such a thing. The world will tell us, depending on which part of the world that you're in, one part of the world will tell you, in order to address guilt, you must follow a prescribed set of actions, do a, to a prescribed set of things that will allow you to earn favor with God or with man, and do these good things, and, and, and enough of these good things will ultimately cancel out the things that are making you feel guilty. Um, another part of the world, perhaps here in the West, They'll tell you that guilt is a sign of weakness and should just be eradicated. You shouldn't feel guilt. You shouldn't feel bad about yourself. You should feel good. You should feel, uh, have a healthy sense of yourself and just feel like you can uh, feel good about everything and anything that is, it is that you do. The justice system will say that you're guilty or you're not guilty. And based on what they rule, they will offer up varying degrees of punishment for, for your guilt. What does God have to say about guilt? As followers of Christ, what does God have to say about guilt? It's a very important question for us to think about and answer. What does he have to say about guilt? How does he handle it? And this morning, as we enter into this text, this is a question that I hope will be answered for us as we walk out the door. How does God feel about guilt and how does he handle guilt? And guys, as we begin in Hebrews chapter 9, I just want to again reiterate the context of this, this chapter of this book. The author of Hebrews is writing to a group of Jewish people. Some of these Jews are believers of Christ, followers of Christ. Some of them are not. And so, as we think about the context of the audience that, we're, that the author is writing to, I just want to remember a couple of things. The Jewish culture is rich in history. It's rich in tradition. We have people such as Abraham, Moses, David, spiritual stalwarts or ancestors that are looked upon with high regard in this culture. These men and women have laid out foundations and traditions throughout their time in history. And it's this, it's, it's this very thing that the Jews are looking to follow. They hold it with such sacred regard. And what the author of Hebrews has been doing all along is trying to help the Jews to understand your heritage and your culture is great, but Jesus Christ is supreme. And chapter by chapter, verse by verse, the author of Hebrews is trying to draw the attention of the Jews away from their heritage, away from the, the various traditions and laws that they follow and practice, and ultimately, he's wanting to fix their gaze upon the supremacy of Jesus Christ. 
And this morning, I want us to understand that this is the whole reason the book of Hebrews was written, even to us as a church, is that we would understand that our gaze should not be upon ourselves or upon our heritage, upon anything else aside from Christ Jesus himself. And so that's the ultimate aim of this book. And, and so he's been tackling different issues throughout the various chapters. He's been able to say, Jesus Christ is greater than angels. He's greater than Moses. He's greater, uh, the greatest high priest. And chapter by chapter, he's establishing within their own context the supremacy of who Jesus Christ is. Uh, this morning, he tackles another issue. This issue has to do with a covenant. The old covenant, and he's bringing up a new covenant. In verses 1 to 8, I'm not going to read through it. Um, it's full of various different pieces of information. But just glance at it with me just for a second, if you could look at verses 1 to 8. And I'm going to do my very best to summarize it. When we talk about the Old Covenant, just to give you a background, God, through Moses, established a way for the Israelites to worship Him, to handle sin. And verses 1 to 8 kind of illustrates what that's about. In these verses, the author describes the layout of a tabernacle, right? And he, he specifically talks about uh, two different parts, the holy place and the most holy place. Now, the tabernacle was used uh, by the Israelites as a means of worship, but also as a means of handling or managing their sin. And he specifically talks about the holy place, which is a place where only priests were allowed and they would perform sacrifices and ultimately other uh, priestly duties. And then there's the most holy place, also known as the Holy of Holies. And this is the place where the high priest would go once a year to offer up sacrifices on behalf of the people as well as himself. And that's one day a year known as the Day of Atonement, the Day of Atonement. And this was the most important function out of the entire tabernacle. This is what God instilled in Mo through Moses and for all of Israel as a means of for Israel to worship him as well as a means of, for them to uh, deal with their sin. And I want to read one verse out of this text uh, in chapters, in verses 1 to 8, verse 7, if you could look at that with me. But only the high priest entered the inner room, and that only once a year. And really pay close attention to this phrase, and never without blood. And never without blood. Which he offered for himself and for the sins that people had committed in ignorance. I want you to pay close attention to that phrase, and never without blood, because I think the author is trying to highlight a very important reality in, in how God required Israel to deal with sin. God specifically required the blood of animals to be used throughout the tabernacle. And if you really think about the tabernacle, it was a very bloody very gory place to be. I don't know how many of you guys have ever been to a meat factory, but I imagine it would be somewhat similar to what the tabernacle looked like. And the reason I say that is, is because everything, literally almost everything in the tabernacle was sprinkled in blood. From the people that were performing the priestly duties to the instruments that were used in the tabernacle, they were all sprinkled in blood. Very gory, very bloody place. In order for there to be a cleansing, God required there to be bloodshed. In verse 22 of this very chapter, it says, in fact, the law requires that nearly everything be cleansed with blood, and without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness. Without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness. So in order for mankind to be forgiven, God required a death. God required bloodshed. And we may ask the question, what's up with God? Isn't this kind of creepy? Why is he into blood? I mean, this is gross. This is disgusting. Why is he so into this seeing blood everywhere? What's up with him? But I just want to help you understand that very, from the very beginning, this is the way God viewed sin and how to deal with it. From the very beginning, when Adam and Eve sinned, they tried to, to, try to cover up their nakedness by sewing fig leaves together. 
But God wasn't pleased with that. And ultimately what he did was, is he had an animal sacrifice so that the, the nakedness of Adam and Eve could be clothed by the skin of animals. And I would say that that was where the first sacrifice of humanity began, was at the Garden of Eden. And that clearly illustrates for us, going forward for, with Abel, that the sacrifices that pleased God was the death and the blood of animals. In Romans chapter 6, verse 23, we read that the wages of sin is death. So in order for us to uh, be able to... So essentially, the result of sin is that something or someone had to die. Blood had to be shed. It's just the way God set it up. Sin results in eternal death. And under the Old Covenant, God permitted the people to sacrifice animals to appease this requirement that someone or something had to die. The people were cleansed through the shedding of blood of these animals. As we get back to our text, I want to get at what the author is trying to tell us through these first 14 verses. He's wanting to identify the limitations of the Old Covenant. In, in doing this, he wants to highlight the benefits that the New Covenant through Christ brings us. All right? I want to bring out the first limitation. There's several of them, I'm just going to highlight a few. Number one, the earthly tabernacle that the people had constructed was a copy of the real thing. In Hebrews chapter 9, verse 1, as well as in Hebrews chapter 8, there's, and as well as Hebrews 9, 24, there is an understanding that there is a heavenly tabernacle that is more perfect than the earthly tabernacle. The heavenly tabernacle is where the presence of God resides. And so no matter how hard the Israelites were trying to offer up worship and sacrifices at the earthly tabernacle, it can never compare to the real thing. And the benefit that we have through Christ is that in Hebrews chapter 9, we read that he enters in, not through the earthly tabernacle, but he enters in on our behalf into the more perfect heavenly tabernacle. He enters in before the presence of God. That's the benefit of Christ and the new covenant. Number two, God's presence was inaccessible to the people under the Old Covenant. As I told you just moments ago, in the tabernacle, priests were allowed in the holy place, and only the high priest was allowed in the most holy place. The people were on the outside looking in. They could never get into the presence of God. They could never uh, enter into the place where God's presence came. They were always on the outside, in the outer court, looking in. But by the new covenant through Jesus, we read in Hebrews chapter 10 that we can approach the throne of grace in confidence because he has made the way for us to enter in to the throne before God. Through Christ's sacrifice, we don't have to go in once a year, but we can go in 24-7. I want to get at the third, a third limitation, the limitation of the old covenant. Please turn with me to verses 9 and 10 of Hebrews chapter 9. This is an illustration for the present time, indicating that the gifts and sacrifices being offered were not able to clear the conscience of the worshiper. They are only a matter of food and drink in various ceremonial washings, external regulations applying until the time of the new order. Limitation number three, and perhaps the most significant limitation for us, is that there was no remedy for guilt. Even though the priests and the high priests would offer up these various different sacrifices before God, there was no remedy for guilt. The people were still guilty. They still carried with them a guilty conscience. And there was nothing that could be done to restore to them a clean heart. Nothing could be done. And as a result, Mankind lived in sin, defeated, broken, and continually engaging in acts of sin. Nothing could be done. 
The chains of sin and guilt still imprisoned mankind. In fact, the solution to this problem could not be found on earth. As I mentioned to you moments ago, sin was dealt with, with by the shedding of blood. But there was not an animal or enough animals that could be sacrificed that could in any way handle sin or could d delete sin or could provide a clean conscience for mankind. Sin could not be dealt with by anything, by anyone from the earth. There was no way out. Whose blood was strong enough to cleanse us from the sin and the guilt once and for all? In verses 11 to 14, we find the answer. Jesus Christ. He went through the heavenly tabernacle and entered into the most holy place before God with his own unblemished blood. And he offered himself up so that we could have eternal redemption, but as it says in verses 13 and 14, we can have a clean conscience. We are no longer guilty. We are no longer uh, found guilty by the things that we've done and acts that lead us to death. See, the author of the book of Hebrews is wanting the Jews to understand that they cannot depend on their traditions. They cannot depend on the sacrifices of animals. They cannot depend on their heritage to save them from sin or to save them from the guilt of sin. But the only one who could do this was Christ himself. The only one who could save and rescue them from the guilt of sin was Jesus Christ himself. His blood alone could do that. His blood was supreme far beyond any one or any animal on the planet. And this morning, I want us to just to ponder what the author in Hebrews is saying. He wants the Hebrews, the Jews to understand that they no longer have to depend on animals or sacrifices, but they can depend simply on the presence and the blood of Jesus Christ. And this morning, I want to ask you a question. This morning, are you living under the Old Covenant? Or are you living under the New Covenant? Which covenant do you follow? See, although we may be followers of Christ, I believe that many of us seated here or listening online are following the Old Covenant in that we are continually looking after following Jesus by our own good deeds or by our own good actions. We dismiss the fact that Jesus shed his blood. We dismiss the fact that Jesus died for us on the cross. And we continually look to come to Jesus and come to God based on our good actions and our good deeds. Much like the Old Testament church did, it's in that they would continually depend on their sacrifices to get them to God. Are we any different than them this morning? Do you rely on your good actions before God? Do you believe that because of your good actions that you were redeemed, that you were declared redeemed by God? Are you living under the old covenant? Or are you depending on the new one? In Isaiah chapter 64, verse 6, it says that God's view of our attempts at self-righteousness are as filthy as menstrual cloths. It's a very graphic description of how pitiful and pathetic our attempts are and attaining righteousness. This morning, uh, again, I just want to reiterate the fact that, this, that the supremacy of the blood of Jesus is what allows us to have eternal redemption, not our actions, not our works. This morning, I also want to address another group of us, if not all of us, is how is it that we handle guilt? How is it that we handle regret? You know, I think it's important for us to, to understand that guilt is something that we will wrestle with throughout our time on earth. And we will constantly look at different ways of how we can respond to guilt. Now, guilt can come at us from different angles. One, it could be that we feel very badly about a specific sin that we committed against someone. 
maybe the magnitude of the sin that we committed is so great that it's it's essentially making us feel as if we're unable to commune with God and unable to commune with each other. Or maybe we feel as if we're continually committing the same sin over and over and over again, and it's hindering us from being able to have a relationship with God. We feel guilty whenever we come before his presence and before each other. Or, or maybe it's the people that we hurt. Maybe there's someone in our life that we've hurt so bad, and even though they've forgiven us, we're still feeling a sense of guilt. You know, we can comprehend God forgiving us in our mind and our brain, but the sense of guilt is something that we carry with us even after we feel like we've been forgiven. Some of us struggle with that. I know I do. You know, when you commit the same sin over and over again, when you do something so just you think it's so disastrous that you can't be forgiven for it, this feeling con just continues to to resonate with us and with, with each other. And it paralyzes us. If you think about it, guilt paralyzes our faith. It, it paralyzes our ability to, to trust in God. It paralyzes our ability to believe God can love us. And it paralyzes the church. It paralyzes you from doing the thing that God has created you to do for accomplishing the purpose that God has created you for. When you allow guilt to fester in your life, when you allow your shame to fester in your life, and it becomes the, the very view of everything in your life, it begins to paralyze you from accomplishing the purpose for which God created you for. And much like the Israelites in the Old Testament, we are much like them in that we walk around defeated in shame because we feel as if there is nothing that can remove this guilt from our conscience. In the Old Testament, under the Old Covenant, the author helps us understand that there is no blood on the earth that can remedy this guilty conscience. There is nothing that can be done to remedy this guilty conscience. But under the New Covenant, which is established through the blood and the sacrifices of Jesus, we read this. If you could turn with me to verse 14 one more time. How much more then will the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself unblemished to God, cleanse our consciences from acts that lead to death, so that we may serve the living God? The blood of Jesus is the only component that can cleanse us from guilt. And the problem with the church today is that we're constantly looking at different ways of how we can handle guilt. We try to do enough good things. We try to do enough things for the church or, or, or try to cover up our guilt in some form or fashion. But the, the, the word of God clearly states that the only way guilt can be removed from us and our consciences is only by his blood. I want to remind us that God prescribed that blood had to be shed in order for sin to be cleansed. And that blood was his own son's. Through his blood, not only are we eternally redeemed, but we are, and we've, given, we've been given grace for the future, but through his blood, we've been given grace for the present so that we can live forgiven, clear conscience, with a clear conscience, without guilt. But yet, we fail to understand that, and as a result, guilt cripples us or paralyzes us. And ultimately, if we allow it to, guilt can get so strong, can get so overwhelming, that we become numb to it. We continue to engage in sin, deeper and deeper and deeper until the spiral can go no lower and we find ourselves completely numb to the sin that we're trying to avoid because of guilt. Many of you know I work in a jail and so my job uh, is to assess inmates on a day-to-day -day basis. And I can't tell you the number of times I've come across uh, inmates who have committed heinous crimes such as murder or assault or, or rape or whatever and you look at them you assess them, you walk away, and you can't help but, but see that they have no remorse for what they've done. 
but they'll flat out tell you what they did. And they'll tell you with a cold face, and, and without any remorse, without any sense of guilt, they'll tell you what they did. And I walk away and I think to myself, what happened in that person's life? What did he or she uh, go through to, this, to, to such an extent that they could be numb to guilt, to that degree, that they could commit murder, that they could, could commit rape? What could have happened in a person's life so that they could be so numb to such a heinous act? That's the effect of guilt, is if we allow it to fester so long, it can create in us a, just a complete numbness to it. Again, I want to reemphasize Hebrews chapter 9, verse 14. It's the blood of Christ alone that cleanses us, cleanses our consciences from guilt, not our works, not anything else. Um, I want to help us understand that in order to exercise this gift that we've been given, it's not simply that we come in and just you know, sing a song and then just leave. But the whole way this works is one, we repent of our sin. And number two, we meditate and, and receive the love that Christ has for us. That we receive the sacrifice that he paid for us. That, that the blood that he shed could literally wash away our sins. And this isn't just a one-time thing. It's not just the time you experience salvation, but it is an ongoing daily process where we have to literally discipline ourselves to focus upon the work of Christ Jesus. And I tell you this because if we don't do this, then the cares of this world, the people, the, the opinions of mankind, all of the fears and the worries that this world will bring at you will come at you at like a tidal wave and try to sweep you away from the presence of Jesus. And so it is very important for us to make sure that we discipline ourselves. And I want to be very careful when I say that word discipline because it takes discipline to be able to say, look, I understand what mankind is saying. I understand what the world is trying to tell me to try to take my focus away from him, but I'm going to make sure that I immerse myself in the sacrifice of Christ Jesus. I'm going to make sure that I truly get that this is what is happening inside of me, is that he's changing me. And by that change, by his blood that was shed for me, I can go out and face whatever the world has to throw my way. And from his sacrifice, from the cross, I will choose to make my response. I'll choose to respond to the world, not the other way around. I just want to read the last phrase of verse 14 uh, before I sit down. So that we may serve the living God. The whole purpose of the cross, the whole purpose of Jesus Christ shedding his blood so that we may serve the living God. The result of Christ's sacrifice is it frees us to serve him. When we are so in tune, when we're so overwhelmed with the love of God, we can't help but live in a life free of sin and living a life of service to him. There was a story of this incident that took place back in the 1800s. During the time of slavery, there was an auction going on. And slaves were coming in off the ship. And one by one, people were auctioning for the rights of having ownership of the different slaves that were coming out. And on this particular moment, an African woman came forward. And she was very young, uh, very good looking. And as she stood before the men there, they began to auction for rights to own her. And one by one, as she was there before the crowd, men were basically glaring at her, uh, saying all sorts of things of what they're going to do to her when they own her. And, and just one by one, she was being degraded and humiliated by the men that were standing there. And it came time for people to bid upon this, this woman. And one by one, bids were coming in. Bids were coming in. And ultimately, one man made the highest bid and had the rights to own this woman. And as he was holding his piece of paper, he, said he was approaching this woman to, to claim her as his own. At, at just as he approached her, she looked at him, and she spat in his face. The man 
simply looked back at her, took the piece of paper that he had in his hand, and he ripped it to shreds. And he declared to her, you're free. You are free. No longer are you bound, no longer are you a slave, but you are now a free woman, and you are now free to do what you want. In response, this woman began to weep. And she clung to the man and said, look, I want to follow you. I want to serve you. I want to make sure that you understand that I'm so grateful for what you did for me, and I'm choosing to serve you. It's a similar transaction that takes place with us when we understand our response to the love of Christ. When we understand the depth of the price that he had to pay for our freedom and our salvation, we can't help but respond by serving him. As this last phrase says, that we may serve the living God. Not out of force, but voluntarily because we want to know that we are going to live for him, honor him, and glorify him. In a few moments, as I exit this stage, you will be having an opportunity to partake in communion. And this morning, as you hold the elements in your hand, the bread, the juice, I want you to understand that it was necessary for Christ to die. It was necessary that his blood was shed. It wasn't just some heroic story. It wasn't just some, oh, this sounds really cool. Let me, let me do this because it sounds heroic. It sounds amazing. Let me do this. Let me, let me do it this way. Now, from the very beginning, God required blood to be shed for the sins of his people. The only problem was that there wasn't a perfect sacrifice that could literally take away the sin, that could cleanse the consciences of mankind. Enter Jesus. Jesus enters in. His blood was shed because it had to be in order for us to have eternal redemption and a guilt-free conscience. Only by his blood are we eternally redeemed and are we free of guilt? Only by the blood of Jesus. So as you hold the elements in your hand this morning, I want you to understand that this wasn't just some heroic deed, but this was what was required by your Jesus. This was what was required in order for you to experience salvation, experience a guilt-free conscience. In order for you to be able to live for his glory, this had to be done. And so I hope that it instills in you a heart of gratitude, a heart of worship, a deeper passion in knowing that the depth of God's love is that he would go literally to the point of shedding his own blood so that you would be free. In 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21, it says that Jesus was made to, that God made Jesus to know sin. He who had no sin in him, God made Jesus to be sin for us. And so it's as if the sin that you committed, whether it be today or some other time in your life, the guilt and the, 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 essentially the sin that you committed, it was as if he is the one that committed it. It was him carrying your guilt on his own shoulders so that you could walk away free. And I pray, uh, just as I'm about to leave, I'm hoping and I'm praying that you guys would understand the plea of the author in the book of Hebrews, chapter 9. His plea is that the Jews would understand that they don't have to depend on their actions or their sacrifices or, or their attempts at trying to justify themselves before God. It's all filthy rags. But he's pleading with them to understand the supremacy of Jesus, the supremacy of his position and the supremacy of his blood. And so I alone just want to plead for us to understand that we don't have to depend on our good deeds or our or our good actions because they're all filthy rags before God. And I'm pleading with all of us to understand that we too must depend on the supremacy of Christ, the supremacy of his blood. That was what God required. Don't cheapen it by trying to do it yourself.
Don't dismiss it by trying to think that your good deeds are what is, what's going to get you into heaven. It's the supremacy of the new covenant, his blood. Let me pray for us. Father, I just thank you and I praise you for the book of Hebrews and how it helps us understand that blood had to be shed for our righteousness. It wasn't some heroic deed, but it was literally what needed to happen. And we thank you that you sent Jesus in our place, that his body was broken, that his blood was shed so that we could be eternally redeemed and could live our life guilt-free. Father, we pray that as we, in a few moments, as we take the cup, as we take up the bread, that we would be faithful to recognize the necessity of the blood that had to be shed. And that we would be amazed even more at your glory and at, your, at how you do things. Father, I pray that you would help us to, to be instilled with passion, to be full of a sense of joy and gratitude for what you've done so that it would allow us to serve you, the living God, here on this planet, that we would be faithful to share the good news of what Jesus did to people who yet who have not yet heard, that we would be faithful to, to live in a life, a life that would allow us to, to, to get outside of the bubble and allow us to be courageous and bold with the newfound grace and mercy we have in Jesus. We love you. We thank you, God. We thank you for the blood that was shed on our behalf. Jesus, it's in your name we pray. Amen.